Hello everyone and welcome to the Innovations in Finance webinar series. This series introduces web, uh, innovative financing mechanisms that contribute to the development solutions linking needs, objectives, and actual results. This series focuses on resource-based financing, which, is, which has emerged as an important instrument for financing basic services, uh, basic services because it changes the focus from inputs, uh, funding given in advance for expected results, to verified outputs. Uh, this series uh, focuses on results-based financing. Uh, sorry, uh, my name is Daniel Coila, I'm the operations analyst with the Global Partnership on Output-Based State, and I will be moderating this session. Uh, my colleague Richard Hosier will deliver the presentation and lead the questions and answers session. Uh, Richard Hosier is a senior energy specialist with the Energy Global Practice and the task team leader for the Ghana SHS project, which we'll be presenting today. Uh, the project has been a successful story because it has leveraged private financing and it has achieved its development objective by connecting over 16,000 poor households in rural areas of Ghana. Uh, uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the presentation will be about 20 to 25 minutes, after which we have a Q&A session. We highly encourage your participation through the chat box on the screen. All, all of the questions and comments will be noted and addressed during the Q&A session. If for some reason we are not able to get through all the questions during our session, we'll continue our discussions in our OBA RBF Community of Practice website. This session will be recorded and posted on this site as well as the GPO web website. Uh, now, uh, I hand it over to you. Richard, so you can tell us more about the project. Okay. Thanks very much, Daniel. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk mm -hmm. about this project. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to discuss some of the lessons, some of the experiences and lessons we learned from uh, financing solar home systems in Ghana. Uh, I'd like to just, if I may, take a minute and step back to talk about the context, um, uh, the, the context, <laughs> sorry. Um, the context of the project so that you can understand a little bit about what we were looking uh, at and about the experiences we went through. Uh, some of the lessons that we'll talk about may seem a little bit uh, obvious now looking backwards with 10 years of hindsight from the time we designed the project, but in fact we made some important discoveries and I think some of these discoveries and some of the changes that we ran across in the nature of the market, the nature of the technology, have been folded into much of our energy programs going forward. Um, just to bring you back a little bit, in 2007, 2008, solar home systems were still a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, the bank had started working with some in the 1990s, early part of the 2000s, but most of those, with one or two sections, uh, exceptions were cases where it would be a government procurement of a solar home system that would put it out and that may or may not work and you got very little development, successful development of markets around them so that they wouldn't become sustainable. Uh, there was in fact at the time a great deal of doubt about the value of using solar home systems as a rural electrification uh, technology. And so much of what we were doing in this project is trying first of all uh, to see if we could actually engage um, <clears throat> meaningful rural electrification, make progress in rural electrification using solar home systems, uh, solar lanterns uh, as the technology. And the second thing we had to do is we realized because government, straight government projects, government procurements really weren't all that successful in stimulating the market and seeing the sort of dynamic development that we thought was needed, that we really tried to craft the project about bringing in the private sector and getting the private sector more engaged, more involved on the ground, uh, so that they would make the effort sustainable over the longer term. Uh, so I think these are two of the important factors of the context and may help explain a little bit about what we uh, talk about now as the lessons. Uh, the project ran from uh, late 2008 uh, to about mid-2015. 
Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of what we see now looking back on it and how we're thinking a little bit about moving forward uh, in Ghana uh, over the coming months. Um, just to give you some background, uh, the project was designed 2006-2007. Ghana is an emerging middle-income country with a population of roughly 22 million people, about 50% of which still live in rural areas. Uh, at the time of project preparation, about 45% of the population had access to electricity. Um, that changed over the course of the project and changed some of what we did as we thought about it. Um, Urban areas were largely the areas that were being connected, and so most of what we defined uh, as the baseline project, as the JEDAP, GEDAP, GEDAP project, uh, GEDAP project, I'm not sure how to <laughs> solve, GEDAP. harder, harder soft G, I'm never sure, um, was focused really on uh, electrifying people that lived within reach of the grid. So it was mostly focused on the urban, peri-urban areas. Um, in the rural areas, only about 15% of the population had grid connections at the time we designed the project. So how the project was constructed was a large project that's now had three or four rounds of additional financing and it's just wrapping up now. But there was a core IDA support <clears throat> and the IDA support went largely to support uh, Electricity Company of Ghana in improving its distribution improving its functioning in terms of metering and in extending uh, electricity to more people, more people in the existing service areas of ECG. Um, and that was paid for with, a, with an IDA grant at the time. Um, about $3 million of the IDA support was set aside for the solar home system component. All right, and that went to pay for uh, the loans being processed through the rural banks. There was also a GEF component, and the GEF component of about $5 million supported stimulation of the market and the policy environment for renewable energy. It also provided capacity building uh, for um, actors in the ministry and also for actors that were going to be working with the rural banks and even for um, the, company, the rural energy companies. GPOBA funded an output-based subsidy that was focused on uh, really how do we best deliver a subsidy um, to the households to enable the poorer households in the rural areas to purchase its solar home systems. Um, and it was, it's pretty important because at the time that the project st started, a solar home system might run as much as um, Three four hundred dollars, which is outside of the reach of uh, most Ghanaian rural customers, and so the financing through microfinance entities was important. But it was also important to have a subsidy element to help defray those costs. And one of the things we see as we look back is that over the course of the project, the actual costs of the technology fell pretty rapidly. Not just to the because of the fall in the price of solar panels but also because of um, the increasing use of LED light bulbs. And that sort of provided a knock-on effect so that at the beginning of the project, we were talking about solar home systems using compact fluorescence. By the end, we were focusing on solar home systems providing LED bulbs, which use far less electricity uh, for the same amount of light. And so it had this knock-on effect of driving the costs down. And one of the things that we see as we look back is that there's been, and there continues to be, a lot of dynamic evolution in the technology of solar home systems, making them cheaper per uh, lumen of light or per, per unit of electricity produced. Um, and so that changes a little bit, making mo uh, changes our perspective, making uh, the technology cheaper, more affordable, and also more effective as a way to supply increasing quantities of electricity in rural communities. Uh, but it's important to remember that the GDAP project was not the first project funding PVs for rural electricity in Ghana. Uh, and as we, whoops, wrong button. As we go forward, we can see, and actually these are some pictures taken in 2009, 2010, uh, and you can see some of the relics of previous projects around the, littered around the countryside. Um, 
these photos are actually taken of an EU-funded uh, public lighting project uh, where they hadn't really thought about the uh, maintenance and who, how are you going to maintain the the systems over time? So you see these solar panels, uh, which are still working, generating electricity, but they don't have any effect on running the lights at night because the batteries are dysfunctional. So what the people do it did in the rural areas, they just figured out a way to use those electrical wires from the solar home system to charge their own batteries. And they would take these batteries at night back to their homes and use it to run their lighting and so forth. In addition, there was an earlier project called RESPRO. Uh, don't ask me what the acronym stands for. But it had been funded by Jeff. Um, it had disseminated systems to rural communities, but it didn't insist it was a pure subsidy program, so it did not insist on any payments from the rural customers. Um, it relied on a government delivery mechanism not private sector engagement. And we looked at that. And in fact, uh, when we went up to do site visits at the beginning of the project during project design, we found that many of the systems had actually uh, disappeared or the panels had, if you will, sprouted legs and run across the border to Togo or Benin, where they'd been sold for other purposes. So there was a history in Ghana, even at the time we started, of unsustainable uh, electrification with solar home systems, and we were determined not to make that same mistake as we moved forward with the GDAP project. Um, one of our hypotheses was that if we get people purchasing, contributing, they would take more charge, more ownership, more responsibility for their systems. And the other is if we get private sector del companies delivering them, uh, they would eventually grow so that they had profitable businesses in both sales and maintenance in the areas, and that would make it a sustainable marketplace moving forward. All right, so let me run through the objectives because this was a um, standard bank project. There is a PDO because there was a GEF, there is a GEO, Global Environmental Objective, and then within the GPO, BA, uh, component or contribution, there were separate objectives that were identified to try and make this market intervention sustainable. The overall project development objective was to improve the efficiency of the electricity distribution system and to increase the population's access to electricity. Okay, and so that was the broad sort of PDO in the, in the pad. Uh, the GEO was the support from global environmental objective from the GEF side was to support Ghana's transition to low carbon economy through the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And on the GPOBA side, there were actually three objectives that we wanted to look at. Uh, first was to build and strengthen capacity of local dealers in the sales and maintenance of solar PV systems. But the second would be to promote the use of solar PV systems and lanterns as alternative sources of energy in the rural areas. And the third is to provide electricity to communities which didn't have access to the national grid service. All right. The targeted output for the project and for the GPOBA intervention was to provide solar electricity to 15,000 households. And the outcome in broader terms that we wanted to see was the demonstration of a viable model and to initiate the initiation of the market transformation process to provide electricity to rural households without access to the electricity grid. Okay, so these are the broad objectives. Um, and in general, uh, I think they were achieved. We'll talk about that as we go forward. Just to back up on some of the design issues to make sure that you're understanding how this fits into the GBA, GPOBA, I hope it's clear how it fits into the energy practice uh, objectives of trying to provide electricity for all, but fitting into the OBA concepts, adopting the OBA concepts, the first is that of targeting. Who's the population that we're trying to target to make sure that we're getting benefits to those who really need it? Um, what we defined as the target population were the uh, rural poor and to a degree some of the peri-urban poor in uh, the upper, uh, that's a little bit tough to read, but in the upper west, upper east, and northern parts of Ghana, you can see on this map, um, I can't point out to you, uh, but basically the areas north of Tamale, okay, um, 
are largely dryland areas, semi-arid areas, uh, low population density in the grid that really only barely touch the surface of providing electricity to the population there. And this is one of the poorer parts of the country. So while we may not be hitting the poorest of the poor in those areas, there was certainly a case to be made that these were, and if you look at the income records, these were the poorer regions of the country. In addition to this, if you look around uh, the body of water in the center of the country, that's Lake Volta, takes up somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the surface area of the country. But what it also does is create areas which cannot be reached uh, by the conventional electricity grid. That is to say, island areas, areas on peninsulas, anywhere basically where the road doesn't reach um, is not going to be electrifiable by uh, conventional means because you can't drive out there with the poles and the cables. So all of these were target areas, including some of the islands in Lake Volta, some of the islands in the uh, Volta River above and below the dam. Um, and so these were the targeted areas where we were looking for uh, to supply electricity through photovoltaics, solar home systems, and lanterns. Um, in terms of the accountability, there was a subsidy, as I said, which value was valued at up to about 50% of the value of solar home systems and some of the lanterns. Um, this subsidy, 80% of it was paid by through an apex bank, which was the regulatory body that uh, sort of governs the community rural banks. Um, it was paid by ARB apex bank to the suppliers. Uh, once those systems were installed, inspected, and verified, and confirmed to be uh, working successfully to the satisfaction of the purchaser. So that subsidy would go to defray a uh, significant amount of the cost of the larger systems and even uh, some of the lanterns. Um, there was part of this subsidy, though, that was held back to help pay for battery replacements. And this was an issue that became problematic because, in fact, uh, much of the project closed before they got organized for the battery replacements. And so this was um, one of the things that was actually a, a board condition that got approved um, when it went to the board that we would recycle the lead acid batteries. And in the end, the uh, uh, Ministry of Energy wasn't able to see that that happened. So that was a, one of the disappointments of the project. Um, in terms of innovations, the IDA funds uh, were channeled through Apex Bank to provide loans for purchasers, and it was up to three-year tenor on those loans. Um, and the local banks had to carry out uh, due diligence on the customers to make sure they were credit worthy. If they were not previously a customer of the bank, they'd have six months to open an account and to operate it to make sure that they were credit worthy. Um, and there was a one-year warranty required of all vendors, and in fact, the vendors uh, actually appreciated being called back is what one of the things we found if there were problems with it because that gave them a much better uh, interaction with their customer base. Um, the incentives provided by the GPOBA uh, grant funds were used really as incentives to serve the poor. That is to say, without these subsidies, it became pretty clear to us that these suppliers, there were only three PV vendors engaged at the beginning of the project, these suppliers without the support would not have gone out uh, and sold in these remote areas. It just wasn't within their mandate. And as, as uh, time went on, uh, the electricity sector in Ghana had more supply problems, uh, some pricing issues had brought that on, so there wasn't enough supply. So everyone, even in um, downtown Accra, were experiencing pretty severe power outages. So many of these suppliers, without that subsidy, would have been very happy just to sell in the peri-urban areas of Accra, where the demand was up, um, because people couldn't get electricity from the grid. So these incentives really directed them into an area they probably wouldn't go have gone to if left to their own, uh, these areas, remote rural areas. Uh, the verification and monitoring all of the systems installed, including, including the lanterns, uh, were inspected to make sure they were working. We started off with a 100% sample of both the systems and the lanterns uh, by independent verification agents who are qualified uh, installers. 
and technicians. Um, finally, we scaled back on the inspection of lanterns, but I think that the project team decided there was so much value in maintaining the inspection of the systems that they continued 100% inspection throughout the project's lifetime. Um, in terms of sustainability, uh, I think the project succeeded in demonstrating successful business model um, and that this really was an area in which the private sector could be engaged to bring financing to bear, bring their expertise to bear. Uh, there's a market out there and people were willing to pay for this technology to get them basic electricity. What clearly didn't work for us was the battery replacement strategy um, and uh, the holding back of the, the subsidy for that. We tried to release it uh, at the end, but not all of the subsidies got paid. Um, but in general, the sustainability, I think we've seen the technology being very sustainable moving forward, and I think uh, the vendors are continuing to sell in the rural areas. Um, moving on, the financing model quickly is that you see at the top the item money being channeled through the government of Ghana, through Airb Apex Bank, which was sort of in charge of certifying and providing support to the participating rural banks. What happens in the process, the actual steps are that the rural bank would first approve uh, consumer loans. Um, the consumers would pay their down payment, which was between 10 and 20 percent of the value of the system. Uh, and what that would do would unleash then the solar uh, PV dealers over in the orange box uh, who would go ahead and install and carry out any maintenance that was needed to make sure the systems were up and running. They would then notify, uh, install this so the consumers, then notify uh, the rural banks that the systems were ready for inspection. Uh, so they would then call in the independent inspectors who would go and inspect all of the systems that were installed. Once they were verified by these inspectors to be working, and what we found at the end is that the installers would actually go with the inspectors so they could rectify any problems immediately uh, upon their identification so the customers could get immediate service. Um, once this was done, then the subsidy payment would be released from the rural banks to the vendors. And the consumers then over time, over the three-year time period, would pay back the loans. So it worked out well. Um, the loan recoveries were proceeding upwards of 90% uh, in most of the areas. There were a couple of regions, um, and for various regions where the loan recoveries were lower than that, um, 75 to 85%. And part of it was that these were the regions where there had been the most sales. And so the project had provided uh, one agent uh, to handle this for each of the participating rural banks, but where the sales exceeded expectations, uh, the sales agents at the local bank level um, simply were stretched and were not able to get there and, and uh, collect all of the payments. So that's something I think technology would deal with going forward as we look at it. One of the bigger problems we find, we found, however, and it took us about 12 to 18 months to resolve, was this question on how the dealers, the uh, PV vendors, got the capital, their working capital, to do the import, the trade finance that they needed to do their uh, inventory finance. Uh, and this is something, one of those things that we now kick ourselves for, oh yeah, that should have been so obvious, but it really wasn't at the time because there were pretty strict standards at the beginning on which vendors were allowed, and they all had to show a track record in financing on their own. Uh, but they still, since many of them, they were not primarily solar dealers, the solar business was their second business. So as they made internal capital decisions, the solar would get short shrift frequently from their boards. Um, and so they couldn't obtain the financing. And many of them had worked on previous World Bank or ECG contracts and had known how they would get the, the financing from that. But the same vendors, the same financiers, couldn't obtain financing because it was, wasn't a guaranteed sale that they, they had. And so they were unable to bundle the sales. And to, some of the banks didn't even think solar would work to generate electricity. So they threw a couple of the vendors out when they went to see banks. 
So it took us a while to find a way for these suppliers to obtain financing uh, to increase their inventory and to purchase. Um, yeah. Okay. Now what do I do? Huh? Here we go. All right. Thanks. Uh, put this in. This is the sales growth pattern. And you see after the first six months there of the project, which is December 2009, there were only about 400 systems that had been sold. Most of these were lanterns. The lanterns cost uh, maybe, at the time, they were all less than $50. Um, so it was a single light unit. Um, but this is when we started discovering this dealer finance problem. And so over the next year and a half, two years, until the end of December 2011, we found a way to get that solved. Um, and then that's when the sales took off. Um, so that by the end of the project, December 2013-2014, you'd see that 7,000 almost double or 170% of the target um, for sale for lantern sales had been reached, almost 8,000 lanterns. For the small and medium systems, it was about 3,600 lanterns, which wasn't as much as we, systems, sorry, not lanterns, wasn't as many as we had anticipated, but what really drew people in, and you see this is the one uh, for the larger systems going down on the left, this is the one that really exceeded uh, the expectations of the project. Over 5,000 of these larger systems were sold. What we found is that people really liked the larger systems because they would, could get and operate a color, an LED color TV on these systems. And that's what drove sale. It was sort of the, um, what would you say, the curb appeal, or it was the aspirational appeal of having color television in your house. So overall, the uh, sales exceeded by about 12%, the targeting sales, and somehow the money all worked out, so we had sufficient funds to, to pay the um, output-based rewards on that. Um, so it worked out very well from that perspective. Um, you can see the sales results as they broke down by types of systems from the lanterns up to the large systems. And the truth is we didn't really know. We had expected there to be more small systems, but when LED TVs came on, it just blew the systems, sort of blew the market wide open for these larger systems, and that was what really drove it. Um, Daniel and I visited um, the community, actually, where we took the pictures of those uh, batteries and the light, and it was, I believe it was uh, the year after the... A night after the Black Stars, the Ghanaian soccer club, had played in the World Cup, and we visited one site and we saw that they had mats set out all over the uh, all over their their house. There was the TV set up in a corner, and the mats were all strewn with beer and soda bottles. So they had had a fun time watching the Black Stars for the first time play in that local community of Lordi. Uh, number three, I think, was the community. Yeah, Anyways, very happy of it. Uh, yeah, so we went there and we had a good, uh, good laugh with the owners of the system. I'm very pleased to see it. Um, let me just run through quickly at the end. I'm taking a little bit long, um, but some of the challenges and lessons that we were learned. First, on the financing issue, that is, how were the vendors, the dealers, supposed to get financing? This was really an oversight on our part. Um, it took a 12 to 18 month delay. Some of the vendors had been thrown out by their bankers because the bankers didn't believe that you could generate electricity or solar energy. Um, they weren't able to maintain an inventory as a result and so they'd ship in 10 or 12 systems, which is all they support. They'd sell those by the time they showed up in country but they wouldn't get the money, so they couldn't actually go back and replenish their inventory. Uh, there was one vendor who was large enough, and he sold enough other uh, consumer electronic pieces that he was he had no need um, of additional financing. Uh, they managed that internally, but at the end, uh, they confessed to us that, in fact, they had always lost out on internal sales for backup systems at the time. Uh, but the other uh, key vendors uh, had to find new avenues of financing, and so we spent devoted some time and some technical assistance to helping them to develop their inventory financing, their trade financing, 
it finally got sorted out, and that's what enabled the market to grow. Um, there were, and this is one of the important things, uh, I mentioned that solar home systems at the time were innovative, and they've continued to evolve over the lifetime of the project. At the beginning of the project, uh, each system was individually engineered, so you need to have a skilled technician go out, set up the system, run the wiring into the charge inverter, to the battery, uh, to the inverter, you know, and then run out and install the lights. By the end of the project, most of the systems were installed in a box, so they weren't individually engineered. We saw sort of the boom of what we call the Lighting Africa technology and the explosion there, and what you see is that photovoltaic prices fell, even though they, they were they were and still remain, to the best of my knowledge, about twice the cost of similar solar systems in Kenya. And I'm not sure why that is, whether it's the volume in the market or the extra transport costs involved. Uh, while prices remain high, uh, you had the price of the solar PVs falling, you had the price of batteries starting to fall now, and the price of the LEDs, so that the, the price came down over time. Uh, the balance of system cost levelized, the shipping costs remain high. Um, what really changed, and this is what changed the function of demand as opposed to just send it, selling systems that will charge a phone and give you a couple of points of light, the flat, full flat screen TVs became almost universal in the systems. And so that may have disguised some of the price declines that we saw in the technology. Uh, because everybody was paying more and willing to pay more for a system with a television set. Um, but the PV system complexity increased. And in fact, you get more for the money, even though the systems that were being supported didn't show the dramatic price fall. So you're getting a better quality system, a more system able to do more, even though the exact retail prices hadn't, falled, ref hadn't fallen, excuse me, reflecting the change in the, in the price of PVs and LED lights. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised uh, when we look at the uh, GPO OBA approach. Um, I think it was really embraced by both the vendors and uh, the people from the ministry, the people from ARB Apex Bank, so that they had an assurance that their customers were getting something of quality. Um, and when we discussed dropping the level of inspection, it was... I thought they'd say, yeah, okay, let's do back and do a 20% sample or 50% sample. But it was pretty unanimous that they wanted to continue inspecting all of the systems, uh, but they would drop uh, the number of lanterns to a sample size. And it's interesting to note that early on we'd set up a system for the lanterns where the lanterns would be held at the rural banks until the purchasers got to pick them up, and we found that didn't work so well because what, by the guys time the inspectors came, most of the batteries in those lanterns would be dead. And so we had to change that whole avenue of delivery. Um, and I think people saw, the vendors particularly saw that they had a better relationship with their customers and could actually sell them more if they delivered it to their homes rather than just delivering the lanterns uh, all at once to the rural banks. So we had changed and modified the inspection protocol as we went along. Um, one of the other things, so I, I think the inspections did a great job uh, ensuring quality, making sure quality was met and that customers were happy with it. Well, the other thing the vendors told me, which I thought was a surprise, is that compared to normal government contracts, their payments came through much quicker under this, all right, because they can install, they didn't have to wait for the entire contract to com be completed, they can install in a couple of villages and then say, yes, these are ready. So their payments would come to them from the project, the subsidy part, in three to six weeks versus three to six months, which is the normal case for straight government procurement. So this worked out very well in bringing in private sector. Um, so I think, uh, in general, uh, the GBO, GPOBA approach was worked out very well. Everybody embraced it, and they saw the value of it at the end. So I think that was uh, really very helpful. Um, in terms of longer-term sustainability, I think the loan repayments have gone very well. Uh, there were a few defaults. I talked about this a little bit earlier. There are some areas where 
the banks just couldn't get around to collect all the money, and so some of the repayments dropped to 75 to 85 percent. But by and large, in the majority of them, the repayments were over 90 percent. Um, the problem that we had, and I mentioned, is the battery replacement. We couldn't get the battery replaced, so we forwarded the replacement funds to as many of the uh, purchasers as we could, basically a transfer through their uh, uh, rural cooperative bank, their microfinancing entity to, to enable that to happen. And I think in the future, the battery replacement is probably left as a consumer responsibility to work out with their vendors and not insist on that being taking place from the beginning in the project because it just became too cumbersome and too complex. But I think in con conclusions, we exceeded the project targets. Uh, the sales took off at the end. Um, and so that was very good. The outcomes, I think the PV industry exist and it has grown, but as the technology changed, instead of being individually engineered systems, they've gone to plug and play systems, which follows the trend of the industry around the world. Um, I think different companies came in, uh, so as opposed to the initial three companies, there were seven or eight participating at the end, and the quality, the quality, products, uh, quality of products had improved over that time. I think still an output-based aid or a results-based framework is still very useful. I think if we were designing it again, we'd probably lower the subsidy levels, partly because of cost and partly because we're um, wanting to uh, really subsidize provision of these systems to remote rural consumers. Um, and it's not so much that the cost is too high itself, but it's more the delivery mechanism that needs to be subsidized. Um, for set in the government context, the government of Ghana now estimates that 85% of the population has access to the grid, all right, and this is, you need to know a little bit about how access numbers are calculated. That means about 70% of the population actually have connections, electricity connections in their homes, and the other 15% they claim are within reach of the grid. There's a transformer uh, nearby. But as we're discussing with the government pushing uh, pushing for the last mile electrification, I think 100% access within the next five to 10 years as the government is committed to under the SE for All initiative is very much a reality. Um, and so we're going back now to start and to supporting a rational plan, looking at the least cost options for electricity provision throughout Ghana, but this is going to include both grid extension, it's going to include mini-grid uh, extension and more PV systems. And I think as we look more across what's happening everywhere in Africa, and the model that we're adopting increasingly is that support for the last mile electrification, which is very expensive, very remote um, outreach to people in rural areas, it's going to require more support, a larger role for photovoltaics and mini grids to maintain some cost effectiveness. But no matter what we do, there's going to be some need, and we found other very inventive ways to use output-based aid or results-based financing to move forward. And I think we're talking about in Ghana, as we move forward to this last mile, how we can more effectively craft results-based financing or output-based financing to enable that to move forward in as effective and rapid a means as possible. So I think this project serves a very important role in helping stimulate that discussion. And we see now that this approach is being used throughout our rural electrification portfolio everywhere in the continent. So I think that's it. Thanks well, very much, Daniel. Well, um, thank, thank you, Dick, for the sorry very informative. Sorry if I ran too long. No, no, anyway. no, it's fine. Thank you for the very informative and comprehensive presentation. Now we'll move on to the Q&A uh, session. And there are a few questions which we can take. Sure. In fact, there is one uh, related to to consumer loans. Uh, it's a, it's about the interest rate, the, the the size of the loans, and the timeline. Perhaps we can elaborate a little more on that. Okay. Um, quickly, the loans were set to be um, up to fifty percent of the value of the systems, and we would adjust on an annual basis the value of the potential loans according to the change in prices of the system. Um, but typically, those were two to $300 loans for the more expensive systems. 
Uh, we ended up not doing loans at all for the lanterns because the lanterns cost about $20, $30, and we thought a loan wouldn't be necessary. Um, over time, the cost of the systems came down and the value uh, of the subsidy came down as a result. The value of the loan stayed relatively steady. The interest rate, um, it was set according to the local regulations, so we did not have an interest rate subsidy involved. Um, and so when you went through the various stages of the money coming through the Bank of Ghana, then going to ARB Apex Bank, and then going to uh, then the cooperating rural banks, I think it was a little bit upwards of 20% interest rate that was charged over these for three years. Um, and that would vary, but it would vary according to the underlying bank dynamics, not because there was a subsidy involved in the interest rates. Um, this was still very attractive. Uh, it was sort of in range with what the regulated microfinance entities were able to do. I mean, if you there's we all know that there's a huge range of microfinance operators. Uh, some are real sharks charging 60 to 80 percent financing for you know overnight type deals. Um, but we had chosen to work uh, with the government sanctioned uh, microfinance mm -hmm. bank network very for good. that reason. Very good. So there are uh, a couple of other questions, so we'll go in order. And the second one is about the beneficiaries, whether they were involved in the design of the project. I guess moving from that transition from RESPRO to, to the JetUp program that was supported by the GPOEA grant. Yeah, we. Um, Early on, I wasn't the task manager for design, okay. but they did uh, undertake, my understanding is they'd gone to several areas, and I was one of those uh, consultations at the end where they went to consult actual villages in these areas um, and to find out were people interested or not, are people willing to pay or not. And we still didn't have a really good idea, so we tried to then to fold in experiences from other sectors, uh, from some of what we talked about in water and financing and from other regions as well, as to what people would be willing to go for, we'd be willing to pay with, um, pay for the systems. Um, we did do a detailed beneficiary survey at the end and it showed that people were very extremely satisfied with the systems that they got. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd use, you know, they could all document, you know, benefits from studying, you know, health benefits from reducing the use of kerosene. Um, so it was very well received by those who participated. Um, I don't know how much uh, of a DABA process, local community meetings had been involved in design. I honestly uh, can't say, but there was um, attempts to get the design and to get local feedback on that design. You probably can say that, that this financing model was more sustainable than the previous one. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's no question about that. Probably and right. I think it was That's successful in bringing, bringing in private sector financing and bringing private sector expertise to play. So. Absolutely. So now let's move on to the next one. And now this is about the, the life, uh, lifespan of the SHA systems as well as the batteries. How long do these systems last for and how often do they need to be replaced? Yeah. Um, Oh, and, and, and just sorry, just to follow up on the question, you, and also a question regarding the quality of the installation work done by the vendors. Yeah. Um, okay. The design was that solar home, the whole solar home systems would last at six years. Okay, and that was sort of the assumption uh, on the design. However, the battery life, and this has changed also has changed a great deal since the project was designed, but the battery life was considered to be two to three years. Um, and this may have been an assumption at the early stage of the project. I think as time went on, the battery quality improved, but we did start, start to see some drop off in battery performance by two of the project. So the idea was after a, <clears throat> a consumer had had a battery for two years, we would make provision for them to get it replaced. And that's sort of what we tried to set up was a system to channel the funds for the battery re replacement uh, in for those who were early adopters by the close of the project and then we would just advance uh, the remaining cash to them by the end of the project. And that's ultimately what we did. Now, there's always a question on the actual lifespan of a solar home system because as you can see from that early photograph we had of the EU system, 
the PV panels can continue to work forever. Um, and so that's why we drop the, I dropped the phrase in there, the balance of systems. Balance of systems have become much more reliable. And now, I would guess, although I can't be sure, I think what we're doing is five, we're assuming five to ten year, most of our other projects in East Africa, at least we're assuming five to ten year lifespan. Um, but a lot of that depends upon how the system's used, how it's treated, uh, the charging pattern. Um, the abuse uh, that the system may be asked to take by householders. Uh, they did find a fair number. The installations were all done. We found some problems as we ran, went around on project supervision where some of the wiring had been done incorrectly and we brought that to the attention of the vendors and the inspectors and they made sure that the systems were all installed properly after that. So I think we had a pretty good experience with that. Um, yeah, there was some, something I'm... <clears throat> anyways, uh, there's something else I wanted to say, but it okay, slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but just about, there is a related question since we're talking about inspection. So now with the improvement of technology, is there any opportunity to, to enhance the, the verification process through these new advances in technology? Do you, how do you see the, the future? Of yeah, this? what's happened now, and this this sort of technology wasn't available at the time the project was active. It's just come online in the last two years. Uh, but what you see is that there's uh, there are systems that embed a SIM card in them, mm -hmm. so they they can send uh, transmissions uh, to the company's headquarters, so they can maintain, see what's happening on the system, see how the system's performing and also see if the system's down. Some of them are actually pay-go systems. Uh, that is a pay-as-you-go system so that uh, the consumer can log on using their cell phone, mm -hmm. can log on to the vendor system or a microfinancing entity system and automatically pay their bill, pay their bill up front that's needed um, so that you can pay in advance. And some vendors we see in other parts of the world um, as the system is not being used, they'll check to verify that it's using and they see if the consumer's not used, they'll say, well, look, do you still want the system? We'll take it back and give it to another vendor or another consumer who maybe does. So the whole thing of remote communications has uh, put on top added a layer of complexity, but that actually makes financing more reasonable uh, and more easy to implement. And it also makes... Uh, system maintenance and awareness by the vendors a much more uh, reasonable reasonable uh, thing to undertake because they can do it remotely. Very good. Very good. So let's move on to, there is a fifth question, and this is for about the design of the project. Is, is if the project conducted a cost-benefit analysis that accounted for externalities uh, such as benefit of health, uh, reduced environmental burdens, and if so, how is it being conducted? Yeah, the benefit cost uh, analysis that we did was, uh, okay, at the number of levels, um, on the held side uh, was the strongest one. So we tried to look at the financing benefits, what would be the savings that would accrue to consumers through adopting this uh, technology. So what your baseline assumption would be was that they would continue to use either kerosene or candles or uh, flashlights, or torches, mm -hmm. uh, and the batteries, and that would be their baseline cost. Whereas under the project, they would have to um, they would have to buy the system, and then it would be paying back against their savings. It would be that that was the benefit accounting, and it came out extremely positive uh, for the solar home systems from the health perspective. Uh, from the economy's perspective, then if you look at it. And actually, initially, they had done um, a very detailed um, benefit cost assessment using all sorts of interesting elasticities, which I wasn't sure, but they showed a willingness to pay per the first kilowatt hour of electricity to be extremely high and almost, I thought, a bit unrealistic. So the benefits cost came out to be enormous. Um, and that's without trying to add on the shadow price values of health. They didn't do that. Um, even for the education, you know, what's the value of a kid being able to do homework at night? Those are pretty difficult 
factors to estimate, so we didn't do that. But we looked at sort of the alternative, alternative payment structure mm -hmm. and what that would be, and the payback period for most of these uh, came back well within the three-year uh, period, even one to one and a half years. So it looked like a very good um, value proposition from the consumer perspective. Um, and so that was where the thrust of the analysis was. Okay, maybe we just uh, wrap it up with one last question. It's a little bit of controversial, but I think it's it's a fair question. Uh, they may have uh, raised a little bit of concern. So, because uh, I remember, I remember being with you on mission, and and with, this is related to the operability of LED systems, right, and flat screen TVs. And and I remember what you know that what those. LEDs were really were right. That were not, uh, the, I guess, what we know like this color full screen kind of TV, but they were more of a black and white uh, and a necessary kind of TV because the the, the conventional CRT TVs would not uh, yeah. right get the, the capacity of uh, as an SHA system to to be functioning. But maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on this. Uh, so explain a little bit more what what this LCD. LCDs, um, TVs are, and, and how useful Well, they are LCD, I think there are more LED mm -hmm. TVs, right. uh -huh. so it was the same revolution that right. was the, the dropping next, the, the price in the lights, uh -huh. uh, was dropping the price in the televisions. I mean, they weren't jumbotrons, they were like 20-inch LED TVs, maybe the price would be about $100, but as, that's what people wanted. I mean, you have this issue, and we've talked about it for years in this sector, all right, those of us on the development uh, side of things say, oh, gee, we really should be supporting things that people really need. Uh, but once you bring in the market and you look at what people are willing to pay for, um, people who are willing to pay for the color TVs. Mm -hmm. um, while I would have preferred to see there would be a low charge, low electricity consuming DC refrigerator, because that would help with food. Um, the technology hasn't advanced that much, you know, so you don't get those food preservation benefits, which would be, um, uh, which would be something that we would be much more sympathetic to, I think, from a development perspective. But if the market wanted to produce the TVs, you know, the market, the consumers preferred the TVs, which should bring in the private sector, the tumors are allowed to buy, the consumers are allowed to buy the TVs. Mm -hmm. Um, so we couldn't eliminate them from the systems and if the system cost even with the TV came in at below what the original system costs were and it continued to decline down the cost right, right. Um, we figured there was no way to prevent it no way to prohibit it that would not upset sort of the market driver of the project um, and so we were encouraged because the other benefits that come along with that are Reformed populace, uh, better education opportunities, and so forth. Uh, absolutely, and I, and I agree with you. And the same with the, the fridges and in the Canary Islands, particularly in the Water Lake region. I can imagine the, the great benefits of those fishermen just being able to store their their fish, put it in a freezer, and and you know keep it for a longer time. Yeah, than that so. requires more. Uh, that's yeah, going to require more electricity. New, so new it's going to be a very large fishes. system, but. Maybe of mini grids. Actually. Yeah, what we're seeing is with mini grids now, that demand is growing, and they're actually looking. And I had a long-standing argument with the project team that look, these guys are going to want to go to productive uses mm -hmm. because the marginal value product they retain with the fish is much higher if you're selling fish that are iced down as opposed to those that are either fresh or frozen stiff. But they're just in that realization now, so I couldn't convince them at the time. Perfect. Anyway. Well, I think we're running out of time, so maybe we just can um, thank the audience. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this has been a great session. Thank you, Vic. I really appreciate uh, all your, your knowledge that you have shared with the community practice. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, everyone for our next session. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we, we are coming with new webinars uh, in this new series uh, under GPOV8. Uh, and uh, well, thanks, everyone, again. Um, I'll be very glad to, you know, uh, continue looking forward to the success of, of this project and in future activities. Thank you. Thank you.